Good morning. There are two words, two words that rarely go together. You hardly ever hear them put together in the same sentence or even in our life experience. These two words are good and mad. Sometimes people are good, sometimes people are mad, but seldom do you hear these two words go together, good and mad. And what I'd like for us to do today is to look at how we as Christian people can learn how to be both good and mad. Now this series has been concerned primarily with the emotion of anger. And I want you to understand up front that this series has not been just about how you can better manage your anger. This series has not been just about how you can uh, better control your anger. It's not even been about how you can better understand your anger. This series has primarily been about how you can become more like Jesus. How you can become more like Jesus when it comes to this emotion of anger. You know, there were times when Jesus was angry. There were times when Jesus was visibly angry. There were times when Jesus was verbally angry. There were times when Jesus was physically angry. And some of you may be thinking right now, well, hey, well, I don't have any problem when it comes to to being angry, you know, uh, you know, I don't have any problem with being like Jesus in this area of my life. You may be thinking, hey, you know, people see me visibly angry all the time, red in the face, blood vessels bulging in my neck. People see me verbally angry. They see me raising or hear me raising my voice and letting go all kinds of words that aren't good. People don't have any trouble seeing me physically angry. I can push and shove and throw with the best of them. Now, if you're thinking along those lines, let me say, whoa, stop and wait just a minute before you go any further. Jesus was good and mad. So let's talk a little bit about how Jesus was both good and mad. For example, in Mark chapter 3, remember when Jesus was in the synagogue on a Saturday. You say he was at the church service on the Sabbath. And when he was there, remember there's a man there with a shriveled up hand. And the Pharisees who were the religious leaders of the day, they were there watching Jesus like a hawk to see what he would do uh, with this man there with a shriveled hand. Jesus was known as a healer. So they wanted to say, well, will Jesus heal this guy at church on the Sabbath? And the reason they were all worked up about that is they believed that it was wrong to do any work on the Sabbath. And the Old Testament law did say that. And in their thinking, to heal somebody would qualify as a work. So they're thinking, ah, oh, we got Jesus here. We're going to convict him of being a lawbreaker. So they were watching him. What does Jesus do? Well, the Bible says that Jesus looked around at them in anger. Jesus got angry that Sabbath at the church service. He had the man stand up. And he said to him, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand and it was completely restored. You see, Jesus was visibly angry with the Pharisees because for the sake of their tradition, they had rather see that poor man stay in this deformed condition than be healed. You see, their lack of compassion in the name of religion angered Jesus. You could say it was a form of injustice in the name of religion. Matthew chapter 23, we find Jesus verbally angry. He was once again upset with the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. Uh, they were weighing people down with all their rules and regulations and traditions taught by men and oppressing people with all this religious ritual and, and the people just were breaking beneath the load and Jesus accused the Pharisees of not even practicing what they preached. They were loading people down, they weren't helping the people and on top of that they were being hypocrites they weren't even practicing the very things they were teaching. So what does Jesus do? 
You can look there in Matthew uh, 23 and you see him engaging in, in all kind of verbal anger. He called them all, all kinds of things. He called them, you know, hypocrites. He called them blind guides. He called them blind fools. He called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. In other words, you look all good on the outside, but inside you're rotten. He told them that all they did, all the religious things they did was just to be seen by people. You know, they wore these boxes on their head, if you can imagine such a thing. And inside the boxes they had the scripture verses, but they made the boxes extra big so everybody could see them. Imagine what that was like, seeing these guys walking around these big boxes on their head. And the people said, oh man, they're, they're real religious, man. They got the word all up in their head. Well, really, God wanted the word in their, in, in their head, not on a box in their head. Oh, look at the tassels. They had these long tassels on their robes to really show off how religious they were. They loved the chief seats in the, in the synagogue and at banquets where everybody could see them and see how important they were. And so Jesus really launched into to, to these, uh, to these verbal descriptions of them that were anything but flattering. He called them snakes. He called them a, a brood of vipers. Now what tone do you suppose Jesus used when he was calling them these names. I think he was going, you hypocrites. <laughs> you blind guides, you blind fools. You're just whitewashed tombs, just a bunch of snakes, brood of vipers. No, I don't get the feeling he was using that tone. I think Jesus was using a tone that was uh, no doubt one of, of anger. He was upset at the injustice perpetrated on these people again in the name of religion then we see in Mark chapter 11 uh, we find Jesus physically angry and not only was he physically angry of course he was verbally angry and visibly angry as well we all know about this little episode it's when Jesus cleansed the temple of the money changers they were taking advantage of people in the name of religion, the people would bring their money and they had to exchange their money at the temple because the temple wouldn't take regular money. It had to be temple money. When they exchanged their money so the people could buy sacrifices and whatnot, they charged them this enormous amount of money to exchange their money. So they had a little racket going on where they were getting rich off God. And, and on top of that, they, they were uh, causing a big commotion. They'd turn the, the temple into this uh, marketplace when Jesus said it's supposed to be a house of prayer. So the people can't even come in here without getting ripped off or they can't even get in here and pray. You just turned everything into a big mess. And Jesus was not happy about that. So he, he made a whip and he drove them and the animals out of the temple. Again, this kind of injustice angered Jesus. So in these examples that I've mentioned, and by the way, I believe there were all kind of other examples. We don't have everything written down in God's Word that Jesus did. But these examples show us that there were times when Jesus was good and mad at the same time. He was forceful. He was direct. He was under control. He's our example. However, I want to draw your attention to this one major detail. He was angry over injustice toward others, not over injustice toward himself. Think about that. He was angry over injustice toward others, not over injustice toward himself. When personally attacked, he didn't respond with threats. He didn't respond with words. He didn't respond with whips. In fact, the Bible indicates that when Jesus was personally attacked, when he was treated in an unjust way, he remained silent. I love the way the, the prophet Isaiah describes Jesus. Isaiah 53, 7 states, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. And he goes on to say, as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. You know, Jesus, he could have gave them a good tongue lashing, couldn't he? 
I mean, we saw how he dealt with the Pharisees. He didn't seem to have a problem coming up with all kind of metaphors and images that were really insulting. He could have laid it on them. He could have told them like it was. He wasn't some effeminate sissy either. He could turn over those big heavy tables and drive the animals out and made a whip. And you know, I don't know who all he might have hit with that whip. Maybe he didn't hit the, I don't know if he hit the animals or the people or what. But Jesus was not some kind of effeminate looking anemic sissy. He lived outside, camped out all the time, walked everywhere, he's a tough guy. He would have had no problem just taking one of those Roman soldiers and swatting him up and throwing him aside. He could have called down legions of angels to help him out if he wanted to. Never, he didn't advocate uh, that, that his followers take up uh, arms and go out and fight back against the Romans. When they came to arrest him, what happened? Well, Peter had his sword with him. And he did carry a couple of swords. You can imagine why they needed swords, but I don't think it was to, to kill people. Probably kill wild animals and other things like that. But anyway, Peter had a sword on him. What does Peter do when they come out to arrest Jesus? He swings at one of the servants. And I don't get the feeling he was aiming at the guy's ear, although that's what he cuts off. I think he was aiming at the guy's head. Just wasn't a good shot. Remember, the guy ducked. Anyway, cut the guy's ear off. What does Jesus do? He reaches down, picks the ears up, sticks it back on the guy's head. I bet that look weird, don't you? Let's take it back up there. He didn't advocate taking up arms against the Romans. In fact, he said, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So Jesus didn't always react verbally. He didn't always react physically and outwardly and in anger. Uh, he didn't react that way when it came to himself. When other people attacked him personally, he did not respond with anger verbally. He didn't respond, you know, physically. He, he didn't respond in any kind of negative way. And I think it's important that we see that distinction. He only reacted that way at the injustice aimed toward others, not at injustice aimed toward himself. You see, when people mistreated him and treated him in an unjust way, he basically gave it to God. He, he, he saw no need to justify himself. He did not get defensive or insecure. He didn't start gossiping. He didn't engage in passive-aggressive behavior. You know, he didn't have explosive outbursts. You know, he didn't post little negative things on Facebook. He didn't do stuff like that. When people did things to him that could have been interpreted as unjust. No, he, he saw things really from a heavenly perspective. He realized that God was sovereign, God is in control, and he can take care of things. In fact, if you go ahead about 40 years after the crucifixion, God did indeed take care of those who mistreated Jesus. If you know much about history, you know in 70 AD, the Romans just leveled the place. Uh, the wrath of God was poured out on Jerusalem. But don't miss this. Jesus was good and mad. In fact, he even prayed for those who were crucifying him. He actually did good for them by dying on the cross for their sins. And we look at the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us to do the same thing when it comes to our enemies. Pray for them. Do good for them. Really, anger. Anger is a neutral emotion, neither good or bad. The problem comes over why we're angry. When we're angry. What we do when we're angry. That's where the sin often rears its head. You see, we have to be careful when we're angry and ask ourselves, why are we angry? You know, why, why, what's this over? How should I react? You know, I think anger, I really believe this, anger is a God-given emotion. It obviously is. Everybody has it. Jesus had it. The Bible says he was without sin, so I don't think anger itself is an emotion, and I believe he gave it to us as a tool to motivate us to be righteous. God gave us anger to motivate us to do good. So if you're an angry person, there's hope for you. Maybe you've got a little bit more in you that just needs to be channeled in the right direction. I think God would say to you, hey, take that emotion that I gave you an abundance of and take that and change it and use it for something good. You know, we can look, look through history and we can see where, where people have taken anger and done something good with it. 
And I have a couple of examples. Uh, William Wilberforce. I don't know if you ever heard of William Wilberforce, but he was a guy who lived in the late 1700s, and he really got angry. He lived in England. He really got angry over the injustice of slavery. And as a result, he worked politically. He did everything he could to get laws enacted to abolish slavery, and his efforts were not in vain. Before long, slavery was abolished in England, and not long after that, it was abolished uh, in, in parts of America, and then long, uh, not long after that, it abolished in other parts of the world. He set in motion the abolition of slavery in the Western Hemisphere because he was angry at the injustice of it all. It led him to do something about it. I think of Martin Luther. Martin Luther got angry at the, all the superstition and the twisting and bending of Scripture of the church in the Middle Ages. So he led the, the Reformation to get back to the Bible. And you could say in a sense we're here today because of Martin Luther's efforts. Would we agree with him on everything theologically? No. He didn't get as far as he needed to go in my opinion. I won't elaborate any more on that, but, but I think we're beneficiaries of, of his efforts to get the church back to the Bible. But it started with someone getting angry at the twisting of the truth. Of course, early on in the series, we, we talked about uh, another lady, co more contemporary example, mothers against drunk drivers, mad. This woman lost her 13-year-old daughter to a drunk driver, so she started an organization called MAD, M-A-D, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And supposedly they've cut traffic fatalities in half due to drunk drivers. You see, God gave us anger to use it in a constructive way to help, really to help transform us into Christ-like behavior. And I must say before this series, I never really thought of anger that way. Did you? God gave us anger to transform us, to help us become more like His Son Jesus, to help us become righteous people. The problem is, today we have people that are angry about the wrong things. And we have people that, that are not angry enough about the right things. You know, I need some people around here to get angry. I need some people around here to get angry about evangelism. I need some people to get angry that not enough people are coming to the Lord nowadays. I need some people to get angry that the churches in America are, 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 are down in attendance. You know, I hope you come in here sometime and see some empty chairs and get angry about it. Say, you know, I need to do something about that. Maybe you need to share your faith with some people. Maybe invite somebody to church. You see, we need to get angry about the right things. I need some people to get angry about volunteers we need at church. You know, we put ads on Facebook and put ads in the bulletin and make announcements. And I need some people to look at that and get, get angry. There's not enough volunteers around here. They need some help. Get angry enough to do something about it. Volunteer yourself. Or maybe look, look at our, our budget and say when the church is not making the budget and we're going in a hole every month, I need somebody to get angry about that besides me. <laughs> you know, and, and want to do something about it. Be generous. Give to the Lord's work. You see, we're not getting angry about the right things. I need some people to get angry about people around the holidays not having enough to eat. Elderly people. Get angry enough to bring some, 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 some canned goods to church so we can give to people. I need people to get angry about kids at Christmas not getting enough. You know, help send one of the shoeboxes overseas. Or help some people in your town or your area that, that needs something at Christmas. You see, we need to get angry about the right things and not the wrong things. So many times people, they, they, they get angry about things like uh, somebody pulled out in front of me in traffic. Somebody cut me off. This line's too long at the checkout counter. That waitress got that wrong. Somebody looked at me this way. Somebody said this comment. So we get mad over those kinds of things, but then we don't get mad about the right kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's all a matter of taking this God-given emotion and channeling it in the right direction. We need to be more like Jesus. If we're going to call ourselves Christians. If we're going to call ourselves Christ followers. We need to be like Christ. He was angry over injustice toward others, not injustice toward himself. You know, the Apostle Paul gives us a good breakdown of how to be good and mad in Romans chapter 12 verses 17 through 21. Let's take a look at what the apostle says here. and You'll, you'll notice that, that Paul and Jesus were on the same page when it comes to being good and mad. Here Paul shows us how to respond to injustice toward ourselves. Romans 12, I'll be reading verses 17 
through 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In other words, he's implying there it's not going to be possible with some people. They're going to do all they can to mess up your relationship with them and maybe other people. But he said, as far as it depends on you, you do your part. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So here Paul gives us a very, a very nice breakdown of how to respond when others treat us in an unjust manner. First he tells us we should, I'm going to say, refrain from revenge. When we are wrong, we're not supposed to retaliate. Now I realize this goes against human nature. Uh, when we're wrong, we want to get even, don't we? Uh, when we're wrong, we, we want to settle the score. We want them to feel the pain. We want them to know what it's like to go through what we're going through. But God says, no, you need to refrain from revenge. This reminds me of the despondent woman who was walking down the beach one day. And she's walking down the beach. She sees a, a bottle. It's got a cork in the end of it. And, and uh, actually, it's, it's more of like a, like a Middle Eastern looking shape bottle. And she pulls out the cork and out comes a genie. And she's shocked. Ah, oh, it's a genie. And the genie says, thank you for releasing me from my prison. To show my thanks, I'm going to grant you three wishes. But take care for with each wish, your mate will receive double whatever you request. Why, the woman asked. That bum left me for another woman. Well, the genie said, well, that, that's how it's written. That's, that's, that's what I must do. So the woman shrugged and then asked for a million dollars. And then all of a sudden there was this bright, bright flash of light all around her. And there at, the, at her feet, all of a sudden there was a million dollars. And at the very same instant, in a far off place, her wayward husband looked down to see twice that amount at his feet. What's your second wish, the genie asked. The woman said, uh, I want the world's most expensive diamond necklace. Another flash of light. And all of a sudden, the woman is holding this very precious treasure. And in a distant place, her husband was looking for a gem broker to buy his latest bonanza. Jeannie, she said, is it really true that my husband has $2 million now? Is it really true that he has more jewels than I do and gets a double portion of whatever I wish for? The genie said, it is indeed true. Okay, Jeannie, she said, here's my last wish. Scare me half to death. <laughs> when others wrong us, <clears throat> we want to get them back, don't we? We even have little sayings like, give them a dose of their own medicine. Man, you got to fight fire with fire. Don't get mad. <clears throat> Get even. Sometimes people will even twist the golden rule around and say, do unto them as they have done unto you. But that's not what God says to do. That's not how he wants us to respond to personal injustice. Second, remember that vengeance belongs to God. Notice what it says in verse 19. We're told to leave room for God's wrath. In other words, when we're wrong, Paul says, remember to let God take care of it. Vengeance is His. That's His department. God can settle the score much better than you can. That's His place. And believe me, God can see that justice is done to those who wrong us much better than we ever could. He can afflict people with all kinds of things. I'm sorry if that messes up your view of God, but that's what the Bible indicates. You know, God is a God of grace, but He's also a God of discipline. And he can discipline people. And we see in Scripture he disciplined people with all kinds of things from, from sickness to death. Uh, so God, God knows how 
to exact revenge upon people, both in this life and ultimately in the next. So Paul is saying here when people mistreat us, it's not our, our place to take revenge. So we need to back away and let God take care of it. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We see here not only how we should not respond, but we see here in this passage how we should respond. And that brings us to point number three. We're to return good for evil. Now, in my opinion, this is the hardest thing to, this is the hardest truth to obey. Maybe it's not for you, but, but it is to me. It's one thing to ref, refrain from revenge. It's okay, I'll let that slide. But it's another thing to go one step further and actually do something nice for that person. Now, how many of y'all find that easy to do? Got a few saints in here. No, nobody raised their hand. It's not easy to respond with some kind act towards somebody who's mistreating you. I mean, that's the last thing we want to do, right? I mean, our, our, our flesh, our, our carnal nature, if you want to use some biblical sounding words, we, we, we want to, to lash out. Well, we don't want to do something kind. We don't want to do something, do something good. But God's word tells us if our enemy is hungry, we should feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Paul is saying here, if somebody's mistreating you and treating you in an unjust way, you look for some ways you can meet their needs. I wonder if when someone first heard that, they would scratch their heads and say, you got to be kidding, right? I mean, you're not serious. Yeah, he's serious. In fact, when he says this, he's quoting from the book of Proverbs. Even Solomon, Solomon, the wisest man in the world, says to do the very same thing. So when somebody treats you in an unjust way, <coughs> excuse me, look for a way that you can help them. It might be just taking them a cup of coffee. It might be helping them repair something on their car. It might be helping them do something at their house. It, it might be any number of things, some way that you can help make their life easier. Again, it's not easy to do, but that's what the Bible says. And the result is we will heap burning coals on their head. Now, obviously, that's not literal. That's, that, that's a figurative. I mean, if you put some hot coals on somebody's head and kill them, would it not? <laughs> so, so he's not talking about literally doing that. But he's saying that when you do a kind act towards somebody who's treating you in an unjust way, it is like putting hot coals on their head. So what, what does this mean? Well, it, 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 the result is they're supposed to feel ashamed and remorseful and repentant. How can that be? Well, one speculation is that in that day and time they used hot coals to melt metal. And they would put the hot coals on a hardened piece of metal and they got, got the coals hot enough, the metal would begin to melt. That's how they made swords and things of that nature. They used the hot coals to melt the hardened metal. I think what Paul is saying here is that kind deeds toward an enemy has a way of, of, of melting away their hardness toward us. It, 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 it has a way of, of, of softening a person when you respond in kindness when they have treated you in a bad way. I like what one commentator says. He says, the coals of fire are intended to heal, not to hurt, to win, not to alienate. In fact, to shame into repentance. To put it another way, the quickest way to get rid of an enemy is make him your friend. Paul is not teaching us something here that Jesus himself did not teach and live out. We all need to learn how to be good and mad. You know, years ago, I, I read this illustration about a guy that, was at a passion play. And in the passion play, he was playing the part of Jesus and he went through the whipping and the scourging and all that. And then in part of the play, he took the cross on his back and he carried it down the road to a place where he pretended like he was getting crucified. But each night, this went on through the week, <coughs> there was a heckler who came out and this heckler just said all kinds of mean things to this guy who was carrying the cross. It was almost like he had an axe to grind against Christianity and he was taking it out on this guy that was playing Jesus. Night after night he would show up and say cruel, mean, and hateful things. And after four or five nights, he even spit on the guy. After four or five nights of this, the guy looked out from beneath the cross. 
He doubled up his fist and said, I'll meet you after the resurrection. <clears throat> you see, we, we, really, we really mess up the example of Jesus when we are mad and bad. So let's be like our Savior and make it a point that no matter how others treat us, we're all.